In Chapter 3, you will find out more about the network-oriented layers. After working through the chapter, you will understand in detail how network nodes are addressed in the ISO OSI model and how data packets are subsequently transported. If you want to send or receive a parcel, you need to be sure that it will arrive. You could transport the parcel yourself, which would be the safest method. This is normally not practical, so you can task a logistics company with shipping. In this case, you have a choice of control mechanisms which ensure that the parcel will also arrive at the recipient. One possibility would be to take out additional insurance. Logistics companies normally implement tracking systems that you can use to establish the section of the route in which the parcel is located at a given time. In the case of loss, you or the recipient can request investigation. As the sender of the parcel, you therefore have various measures at your disposal to ensure successful transport. Mapped onto the ISO OSI model, the arrival of data packets can be confirmed in the transport layer by acknowledgements. Certain automatic mechanisms are implemented which, for example, repeat data transmission in the event of loss of data. The principle, therefore, has a lot of similarities to secure parcel delivery. In the industrial environment, machines and controllers are network nodes that send data packets and which therefore depend on loss-free data transmission. Let us assume that the sender is a controller and a conveyor belt and a positioner are the recipients. With reference to the ISO OSI model, we are now in the transport layer. This has nothing to do with transporting products on a conveyor belt, but concerns only data transmission and communication of network nodes. There are two important protocols in the transport layer. Both protocols are defined by fixed function sequences which specify data packet transmission to be either connection-oriented or connection-free. Transmission Control Protocol, abbreviated to TCP, is defined as follows. Every TCP data connection has a sender and a receiver. Before data transmission, a connection is established between the network partners through which the nodes can communicate with each other. The connection is set up by means of a three-way handshake. If necessary, TCP can split the data into several smaller data packets for transmission. Each data packet is marked for later identification. When the data is received, it can be sorted and recombined into a data stream. Lost packets are automatically detected by TCP and requested again. This protocol is used when important information is exchanged, for example when loading new firmware. Apart from the ability to send data in connection-oriented form via TCP, there is also a connection-free variant via UDP. Data is also sent in this case from a sender to a receiver. In contrast to TCP, receipt of data is not acknowledged. The data packets are not marked, so UDP is not able to sort the data stream. The user is responsible for assembling the data stream. UDP is used in time-critical applications in which the loss of individual packets does not play a major role. In an internet telephone service, for example, individual data packages can be discounted. Crackles on the line or slight distortions will not be noticed. But time delays caused by acknowledgement of packets would, however, cause annoyance. Before two communication partners exchange data via TCP, a connection must be set up. The three-way handshake which specifies the connection partners is used for this purpose. As the name suggests, the three-way handshake involves a three-stage process. The conveyor belt now has to decide whether it wants to allow the connection to be set up. If it agrees, it returns an acknowledgement for the synchronization request and either confirms the specified parameters or makes an alternative suggestion. For example, a lower transmission speed. In the first step, the sender sends a suggestion for setting up a connection with certain parameters to the recipient, the so-called synchronization request. The controller specifies a specific packet size, transmission speed or packet repeat rate in order to enable a connection to the conveyor belt to be set up. In the final step, the controller confirms to the conveyor belt with an acknowledgement that the connection has been set up. Connection setup has now been completed and data transmission can begin.
Data can be exchanged between the sender and the receiver by means of the negotiated method until the connection is cleared down. Let us return to the example of shipping a parcel. After you, the sender, have delivered the parcel to the post office, the address of the recipient that you have provided is checked. The country must be recognizable and, of course, the exact address. Both are important for checking the route from the post office to the recipient. In the context of the ISO-OSI model, the network layer controls transmission of data packets between the sender and receiver. This involves addressing the nodes as well as route selection for the data packets. A device must have an address that is unique within the network if it is to be accessed as a node on industrial Ethernet. This is the IP address. It is comparable to the address of the recipient in the example of parcel shipment. When the controller wants to communicate with the conveyor belt, it sends the packets to its IP address. The two devices are not directly connected to the same network, so a router is used as an intermediary. IP stands for Internet Protocol and is available in the variants IPv4 and IPv6. An IPv4 address comprises four decimal numbers in the value range 0 to 255 which are separated by dots, for example, 172.16.1.12. In our example, the conveyor belt with IP address 192.168.1.10 and the positioner with IP address 192.168.1.11 are in a network. If the controller in the higher level network wants to communicate with the conveyor belt, it must communicate with the intermediary that is, the router. In general, all IP addresses for connecting to the Internet worldwide are assigned by IANA. In Germany, they are assigned by DENIC. You therefore have no influence over the IP address that you are assigned at home for connecting to the Internet. Three private address ranges have been reserved, however, which are not used for the Internet and can be used for local networks. These address ranges are also used for closed industrial networks. In industrial plants, several hundred or even thousands of nodes communicate with each other. To restrict the secondary effect of errors, it is essential to subdivide and group these nodes into separate smaller networks. As the number of machines in the same network increases, the network load increases considerably, so it is recommended that the plant is subdivided into different production areas. Each system is then placed in a separate IP subnet. The size of the networks and assignment of stations to these networks is specified with the subnet mask. The subnet mask subdivides the IP address into a network address and a device address. The graphic shows the IP address and the subnet mask for a node in a network. All bits of the IP address at which the subnet mask seen in binary terms consists of ones form the network address. The bits of the IP address at which the subnet mask seen in binary terms consists of zeros form the device address of the participant. If two nodes in a network want to communicate with each other without using a router, the network address must be identical for each node. In this example, the first three bytes of the IP address are identical and the condition is therefore satisfied. The maximum number of nodes for this network is 254. Theoretically, the fourth byte allows values from 0 to 255 to be used. Addresses 0 and 255 are, however, not possible as device addresses. The address of the network itself is 0, and the broadcast address is 255 whereby all nodes of this network can be addressed at the same time. We see that a subnet mask is always assigned to an IP address and it is this subnet mask which determines the size of the network and the number of nodes. It is not simply a case of assigning a unique address in the relevant network to the nodes. It is also specified which nodes are situated in the local network and which have to communicate with each other via an intermediary router. What are routers exactly? Routers can be compared with large post office logistics centers. In the example of parcel shipment, the parcels are sent to the destination town from here. In IP networks, routers perform the task of forwarding data packets to the subnet in which the device is located. In contrast to other devices, 
a router has several IP addresses via which it can access the subnets. The controller and positioner are located in different subnets. Communication can therefore only take place via a router. A router tries to forward every data packet that arrives to the correct subnet. The router refers to a locally available routing table that specifies which router interface can access which subnet. The data package is then forwarded correctly in accordance with its destination address. The task of routers, therefore, is to connect the IP subnets. Back to the example of parcel shipment. To ensure that the parcel reaches the recipient, it is checked whether the data of the person, such as the name, is associated with the specified destination address. A check is also made to ensure that the shipment contains all the associated parcels. With reference to the ISO OSI model, this represents the data link layer. It represents the checking stage of the post office and ensures that data packets are transmitted to the correct recipient error free. An important detail in this layer is the MAC address. The Media Access Control address is a globally unique device identifier that is assigned in the factory by the manufacturer. It is six bytes long and can be compared to personal data such as the name of the recipient used for parcel shipment. The first three bytes of a MAC address identify the manufacturer of the network device and are assigned worldwide by the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. The subsequent three bytes are assigned individually by each manufacturer for the interfaces of the device. Before the controller can transfer data to the positioner, it first requires the MAC address of the positioner so that it can uniquely identify the device in the network and communicate with it via the network adapters and network nodes such as switches. Switches can be compared to the person delivering parcels who is responsible for the correct distribution of parcels at a location. A switch is an extremely fast packet forwarding system and is used to subdivide local networks into segments. Every port of a switch forms a separate network segment with its own collision domain. A switch not only increases the performance capability of the overall network, but also that of each individual segment. In contrast to a hub, packets are not sent out to every port, but only to the port where the destination is located. A switch contains a forwarding table for this purpose in which each MAC address is assigned to a certain port. So an incoming data packet is checked for its recipient MAC address and then forwarded directly to the port behind which the device is located according to the table. A switch can establish multiple connections simultaneously between pairs of ports, thus considerably decreasing collision overhead. Switches can forward the packets in accordance with various different procedures. You can find out more about this in the glossary. As with parcel shipment, it is important to know the routes by which the packet will be sent so that the optimum delivery route can be identified and overloading of specific branches can be prevented. Normally, many parcels are sent on the same day. In industrial Ethernet, the structure of the network usually depends on the task that a plant has to perform. There are four typical network topologies star, line, tree, and ring. Star topology is characterized by the use of a central network component with individual connections to all nodes of the network. Advantages include the flexible addition and removal of stations, as well as the easy administration and diagnosis of networks. It is important to note, however, the high cost in terms of the amount of cable laid, the wiring overhead, and the reduced availability due to the central switch. In line topology, network nodes are connected in a linear sequence. This is advantageous when costs have to be saved in the cabling of widely distributed systems due to the shorter cable lengths and reduced wiring overhead. Failure of a node in a line topology will not result in failure of the entire network, but only a section of it. Tree topology is an enhancement of star and line topology in which several stars and lines are interconnected to form an overall network. The advantage here lies in the high transmission capacity of the overall network, with local data traffic remaining within a star point, as well as in the high availability of the independent areas and reduced cabling cost as compared to the central star. 
The disadvantage is that when a higher level star point fails, communication between neighboring network segments is also interrupted. Ring topologies are ideal for creating redundant networks to protect against expensive network downtimes. They can be seen as an enhanced line topology in which the ends of a line can be closed with an additional connection. The ring topology is particularly beneficial in the event of a cable break in the ring. In this case, the ring simply reconfigures itself in such a way that the forwarding routes in the switches are adapted and all network nodes remain accessible. In practice, all four types of network topology are normally present in networks in a hybrid structure. Once networks have been configured, they are rarely adapted or expanded for reasons of cost. Networks are usually then only modified according to their topology in the event of plant expansion. What substantive points should you have learnt in this chapter? Spend a little time on repeating